Hi, I'm Kendall with the Rawls Group. The old African proverb, it takes a village, illustrates the essential nature of a team approach to succession planning. Succession planning is a complex endeavor. As such, it requires leveraging the expertise of a diversity of backgrounds. Collaboration and different expert opinions provides a 360 degree approach, ensuring the possible, probable, and potential issues impacting your long-term vision are addressed. To provide insight into common questions received from business owners, we are leveraging the village of our valued strategic relationships. As you listen to this episode, you'll be able to immediately apply the key takeaways and you'll come back for more. Now we're going to focus on, what do I do if people want to continue working from home once the shelter in place and lockdowns are over due to COVID-19? Uh, we've always had a very flexible working environment and people have the option of working from home um, anytime they want prior to uh, and will continue to have that policy afterwards. But I think the most important thing for um, staff, uh, as long as they're productive, is the feeling of security and safety. And so the more information that people have about what steps have been taken to address their safety and security, I think will allow them to feel comfortable to return to the workplace. Um, that being said, uh, I think it's helpful to have a flexible and uh, optional um, work return uh, policy for uh, the office and individuals so that they can feel uh, comfortable returning when it's comfortable for them, their family, and uh, everyone in their network and, and don't feel pressured to come back. Uh, and as they see things, you know, the great unknown is usually what causes the most stress. Uh, and stress and fear will lead to non-productive time uh, and dissatisfaction overall when usually it's just perception and not reality. So again, I think the key is educating, uh, informing uh, staff on what steps have been taken uh, and making no one feel pressured to do anything they're not ready to do. Um, and continuous uh, discussions with staff on you know, what items have been addressed or what additional items are still of concern so that um, those can be addressed uh, and people can feel comfortable throughout. Um, and after a while, that optional period, I think people would just start coming in more and more frequently on their own without being mandated. Train employees on how to do it and encourage them to um, be reasonable and follow their instincts. In the cybersecurity context, that means training on cybersecurity procedures. Your company should have in place an annual training for employees regarding security, both physical and electronic. Uh, emails to watch for in the phishing context. You probably noticed that with the COVID pandemic, there were a lot of emails trying to get you to click on a link regarding the latest vaccine or the latest news. And those are going to continue to be prevalent as people continue to work remotely. And a primary method of communicating is through emails. So make sure employees continue to be trained and don't open anything that seems suspicious. If it seems odd, stay away from it. Uh, you should have a policy uh, that addresses the use of work computers versus personal devices when working remotely. We recommend using work devices even when working remotely and not personal devices. One of the reasons for this is there is often not sufficient uh, security on personal devices or um, updates so employees have to be responsible for doing their own individual updates if they are relying on their personal devices but if they have a work device then that can be something that is managed through the company's IT department along those lines employees should only log on to the work system through a VPN or other secure network and they should do so using a secure Wi-Fi 
that you've probably heard many times, don't go into Starbucks or the local library, if anyone even goes into those anymore, and use the public Wi-Fi. Uh, it's not secure generally, and that is a playground for hackers because it is very easy for them to infiltrate on a public Wi-Fi. So be sure to use um, secure connections and work devices. If a, an employee is using a personal device, then make sure that device is updated by the employer and has regularly um, installed updates and security measure checks to make sure that it is also compliant with the work standards for devices. Of course, keep your username and password confidential. Uh, there may be more of an inclination to be careless with it when working from home because you feel like you're in a secure environment and that's that's fine to the extent that that is a limited environment but it's not fine if there is someone calling in who purports to be from work or there's an email that purports to be from work and that employee is asked to give over his or her um, secure credentials so again the rule of always keeping your credentials confidential applies equally in the remote environment, even though there is a different kind of security concern when working from home. If you haven't already implemented it, have two-factor authentication. Don't just use a username and password. Have something like a duo or RSA code that the employee has to use and expires after one use. That's an extra security feature that can ensure that the employee logging on is in fact that employee and not an imposter. And then closely monitor employees. Have checkups regularly. Uh, maybe send out a questionnaire, checklist, make sure you are doing X, Y, and Z, which is pursuant to the company's policies. And so those are kind of some general framework rules for cybersecurity. And if you have any questions, we're happy to help you. I'm Elizabeth Shirley with Burr and Foreman, and I'm in the cybersecurity and data privacy group. Thanks. To start, you don't have to let people work from home. It's something you as the employer can decide to do. With that though, you need to consider the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires that employers provide a reasonable accommodation to allow employees to perform their essential job functions. And so if an employee asks as an accommodation, a disabled employee as an, an accommodation, can I work from home? That's something you would need to engage with the employee about. Once you've determined that you're gonna allow employees to work from home, there's a few things to consider. One, all regular employment laws will still apply, and so you don't need to comply with those. Second, you wanna implement a policy. The policy will do various things. It'll set out who's eligible. It'll set out what the criteria is. It'll set out when this program will terminate. Uh, it, almost, it also could discuss will, will equipment be provided and who will be responsible for the equipment and the expense of it. Uh, the, the next thing to consider is the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, one risk with at-home work arrangements is that employees may not properly record all their time, the non-exempt employees. And this can raise issues in whether they're being properly paid and whether they're entitled to overtime. So you want to address that during this time working remotely, employees must properly report time. You also need to consider if the cost of the equipment to work from home, for example, computer, is an expense that's due to be reimbursed and whether that could affect the employee's minimum wage. And that'll not only include the Fair Labor Standards Act, but any applicable state wage and hour laws. Second consideration, another consideration is providing a safe work environment. OSHA requires that employers provide safe work environments and employees who are injured at work can file claims under workers' compensation laws. So you do want to work with the employee to ensure that their work environment is going to be safe. A very important consideration is also the securing of data. That could include confidential company data and it could include protected health information of employees. So on the front end, you want to work with the employee to ensure that their computers are secure uh, and that your network is secure and also that your network could handle an increased workload of employees working remotely. Finally, you want to ensure productivity. And this isn't a, truly a legal issue, but it's, a, it's an important consideration in any work home arrangement. And there are tools, online tools and other tools that employers can use to ensure that productivity is met. But it's something that should be addressed with and discussed with the employee on the front end. If you take all these steps, hopefully you will have a successful work from home relationship with your employees.
answer to that begins with, you should start planning for that question now. And the kinds of questions you probably want to ask yourself involve at least these five. And the first is, what's working for you right now with people away from home? And are some of the things that are going on actually working to your advantage because you don't have people in the office at all the time? The second question is, what's not working at all? So what are the kinds of things that having people away from the office have, are doing that are actually creating obstacles to the efficiency and the productivity that you want to work with, and most importantly, to the level of service you want to provide a lot of your clients? The third thing that goes into your planning is what are you currently doing that could be working better? Because as good as things may be working, there are always things that could be a little better. So get a group of people together and begin going over these questions with them. Once you've formed your group of trusted managers and advisors, then ask the fourth question, what will happen if we let people continue to work from home? And basically, what's the worst thing that can happen if you allow some people to continue working from home. One of our clients responded once when I said to him, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? With, well, the worst thing that could happen is the worst thing that could happen. And I don't even want to go there. But that's part of what you've got to do is you go through, what do we do if we don't, if people want to stay home? And we're not sure whether they should or not. So you want to ask, what will happen if we let them? What's the good that can come out of it? Then the fifth question is, what will happen if you don't let them stay home? And will they come back and will they begin to disengage and go through some withdrawal that, and begin to tell you that I was really a lot more productive when I was working at home? And if that's the case, then part of what you've got to do is start looking at, well, how does a decision to let them go back home impact your resource allocation? And basically, the three resources that you have are your people, your time, and your money. So what positions could it possibly work for? And again, the overriding question is how does it impact your overall mission or purpose? And if you're a client-driven and client-focused organization, you have to pay particular attention to that. But make sure that when you make decisions about who stays and who doesn't, that it's based on position and not on the person. Thank you to our strategic partners, The Village, for participating and sharing your perspectives. Do you have a burning question you want to discuss with an expert? Feel free to submit it via the Ask an Expert link featured on the page. Continue to listen to this series now or come back later for more. Each question featured may want you to learn something new.